Okay, so this is what we dream of as humanities people. We dream of it's a small world after all. We dream of everybody sitting around the campfire, singing kumbaya, and getting along. And we dream of people of various ethnicities, religions, skin colors, liking each other, and talking to each other, and respecting each other. And that's pretty much what we all want. And what we're confronted with is humanity fighting, hostility, arguments that often seem quite ridiculous to outsiders. This is a scene from a Star Trek episode that aired in 1969 during the height of the Civil Rights Movement. We see that these two men are fighting to the death because one man is black on the left side of his face and the other man is black on the right side of his face. And outsiders look at this fight to the death and say, why the heck are these people doing this? Are they crazy or what? And that's what Polish Jewish relations is like. People look at it and say, why are these people fighting with each other? Why do they dislike each other so much? Here's an old map of Poland from the 18th century, and it shows the Jewish population of Poland. According to this scholar, Omer Bartov, and I've seen this statistic elsewhere, 80% of the Jews in the world have some ancestry in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So most of the Jews in the world, the vast majority of Jews in the world, have some ancestry in Poland. So why do Poles and Jews fight? To understand why we fight with each other, I'm going to go back 4,000 years. This is an artist's depiction of Abraham, who is said to be the first historical Jew. He was an average guy living in the city of Ur. He was a pagan. And all of a sudden, God said to him, go, go to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and all nations will be blessed through you. Your descendants will be as multitudinous as the grains of sand on the beach or the stars in the sky. And for the past 4,000 years, Jews have been associated with this piece of real estate known as Israel, the Holy Land, etc. And Jews are further ordered to worship God at a specific geographic location. And the Bible specifies this. Jews must worship God in Jerusalem by sacrificing animals. And you'll see up on the screen a quote from Deuteronomy saying, don't do this sacrifice anyplace else. It has to be in the specific spot that I've given to you. And so Jews do that. They build this magnificent temple. They perform their animal sacrifices. So far, so good. But there's a problem. The problem is the Roman Empire. There have been previous empires that have attacked the Jews, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. This is Pompey the Great, who arrives in 63 BC and annexes Judea into the Roman Empire. And the Jews don't like this, and so they start to fight back. The problem is the Romans are very brutal and very tough, and they don't allow anybody to fight back. Spartacus was a slave who led an uprising, and after Spartacus's uprising, 6,000 slaves were crucified, and their bodies were displayed in public as a warning, don't mess with the Roman Empire. Jews also rebelled, and after one Jewish rebellion, 2,000 Jews were crucified, and their bodies are left along the roadside to warn others, don't mess with the Roman Empire. But the Romans are not taking this. They're not taking these Jews. And so eventually they besiege Jerusalem, 70 AD, and completely destroy Jerusalem. And they destroy the temple. And as you can see in this artist's depiction, the destroyers are carrying off a menorah, a sign of Jewishness. And you can still see that today in Rome. This exists in Rome today. It's 2,000 years old. It depicts the Romans destroying Jerusalem, killing men, women, children indiscriminately, stealing the Jewish items from the temple, carrying them off to Rome. They change the name of the area to Syria-Palestina. This is a gesture of cultural genocide. 
We're going to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth. We're going to wipe the name of their country off the face of the earth. We're going to make practicing the Jewish religion illegal. We're going to prevent Jews from entering Jerusalem. And the destruction is absolute. Now, this raises a problem. If you're one of the Jews who survived, one of the few Jews who survived this Roman massacre, how do you be Jewish? In the past, Jews made their living from the land, like most people in history. They're farmers, they're, they're breeders of stock animals. This is an artist's depiction of Rebecca, a Jewish matriarch, watering her animals. That's something that people have done all around the world. That's something that Jews did in the Holy Land, in Israel. This is a depiction of Jews being enslaved in Egypt. Once again, Jews are making their living by doing manual labor on the land. This is a depiction of perhaps the most famous Jewish man in history, Jesus, learning to be a carpenter, learning to be a manual laborer. But we have this problem. The land that the Jews have been tied to through their worship, through the Bible, is denied to them. How can they be Jewish? How can they hold on to Jewish identity? How is it that we still have Jewish people today, even though Jews have not been able to perform their animal sacrifice in Jerusalem at the temple? In the first millennium, according to these two scholars, Botticini and Eckstein, Jews decided to define Jewishness in a different way. Jews would become readers and writers. This is huge. This is really, really big. Most people in the world can't read and can't write. Now, all of a sudden, you have a group of people who have a language in common, who can read and write, and who are traveling all around the world. This is just a huge history-making change. And this is another depiction of a Jew writing and another one. And not only will Jews read and write, Jews will also become numerate. They will be able to count and do mathematics, add and subtract. I have lived in third world villages where most people could not count to 100 in their own language. They could not do basic mathematics. That Jews all of a sudden can read, can write, can add, can subtract, makes them very special. Jews start moving. They've been kicked out of Israel. And they start moving to other countries and at the same time being ejected from other countries. And we're going to talk a minute about their being ejected. This is the new pattern that emerges. Most of the people in the countries that Jews are moving to are peasants, represented by the black and white photo. Poor people can't read, can't write, basically have no power. And there's also a small aristocratic class they're interested in war, they're interested in domination, they're interested in love affairs. They might not really want to manage their own estates. All of a sudden, you have Jews coming to town. They can read, they can write, they can add, they can subtract. They can manage the estates for the rich upper classes. And Jews become what Edna Bonacic calls middleman minority. They're the people, in terms of the class hierarchy, between the peasants and the elite. They're the people who start banks. They're the people who mint money. They're the people who keep records. They're the people who sell books. They run hotels. They're kind of like a middle class. And guess what? Some people like this. They like Jews as the middleman minority. Other people don't like it. And they start kicking Jews out of their country. Whenever there's a problem, who gets blamed? Who becomes the scapegoat? It's the person who's a little bit different, maybe has a different religion, he has a different approach to money, that person gets kicked out of the country, or even tortured. So, in English literature, England kicked out Jews very early. Three great English authors, Geoffrey Chaucer, who wrote the Canterbury Tales, William Shakespeare, who wrote The Merchant of Venice, Charles Dickens, who wrote Oliver Twist, create very, very negative images of Jews. And these, of course, contribute to anti-Semitism. 
So now we're going to move east. We're going to move east to a country that's very flat, as you can see in this photograph, and also very fertile, as you can see in this photograph. A flat, fertile country. That means there's a lot of farming. That means there's a lot of peasants. Another photograph of this flat, fertile country, Poland. It's also rather wild in the Middle Ages. There are still bison there. Poland, like the other countries in Europe, has this setup, this social hierarchy. You've got peasants on the bottom. They can't read, they can't write. My grandmother was Polish. She never learned to read or write. And you've got the aristocracy. They're immensely wealthy. They're all fighting foreign wars. This particular Polish king is off fighting a war in Austria. He doesn't want to be nailed down to his estate managing these grubby peasants. He wants to hire somebody else to do that. Polish people have another problem. These are the Teutonic Knights. They are German. And they're constantly moving east, and they're constantly killing Poles. And the Poles have yet to defeat them in the Middle Ages. But the Poles must to defeat them in order to survive as a country. They need allies. So the Poles look east, and they see pagans. The Poles are Catholic. The Lithuanians are pagans. They're both being attacked by the Teutonic Knights. The Polish Catholics and the Lithuanian pagans unite to fight the Teutonic Knights. And here we see on the map the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. That's Lithuania, which right up until the Middle Ages was a pagan country, worshipped multiple gods, primarily a god of thunder and lightning. And the Poles are Catholics, and they unite, and they form a united country. And the Poles, in doing this, are signaling, we're multicultural. We like people from a variety of religions. We don't just like Catholics. And one reason we're multicultural is we see that in this union with pagan Lithuania, we can defeat the Teutonic Knights. And they do. In the biggest battle in medieval Europe, the Battle of Grunwald, they defeat the Teutonic Knights. So the Poles are very proud of their multiculturalism. This is a cathedral door from Gniezno, which is a city in Poland. And it depicts Adalbert, a Christian missionary, freeing Christian slaves from Jewish slave traders. So Jews have a presence in Poland going back a 1,000 years. And the early Jews in Poland were slave traders. But it wasn't always so negative. There's a more positive image from early Poland. This is a great Polish king, Kazimierz the Great, who had a Polish mistress, Esterka, excuse me, a Jewish mistress, Esterka. They had some male children and some female children. The male children were raised as Catholics. The female children were raised as Jews. And so when you see people celebrating Poland as a multicultural, multi-religious place, they always point back to King Kazimierz and Esterka, that, that Poles and Jews can get along and love each other. And this idea of Poles and Jews getting along is not just the stuff of legend. It is also the stuff of law. This is the Statute of Kalish, which famously granted Jews rights as Jews that Jews would have control over their own fate in Poland. And this is established in 1264. That's quite a long time ago. And that wasn't just one blip in history. There was also the Warsaw Confederation of 1573. And that photograph is of the actual document itself, where Poles said that nobody in Poland would be given a hard time for his or her beliefs. So Poland is famously, in the Middle Ages, a country that welcomes Jews who have been kicked out of other countries. The Jews do become the middleman minorities. They do manage estates for the Polish aristocracy. They do have their own courts. They are allowed to keep their own religion in the same way that there are Muslims in Poland at this time who practice Islam in Poland. And it's not a problem for anybody. Sounds good. Well. This is the deluge. In the 1600s, Poland is attacked from all sides. Sweden attacks Poland from the north. Turkey attacks Poland from the south. And in the east, 
the Ukrainian peasants rise up, and there is mass slaughter. And Poland becomes a less friendly, less tolerant place. In the 1700s, a weakened Poland is basically destroyed. It's wiped off the map by Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And this image depicts the leaders of these countries saying, I'm going to take this part of Poland, and I'm going to take this part of Poland, and I'm going to take this part of Poland. And what I'd like you to do now is draw a parallel between what happened to Poland and what happened to the Jews. Foreign leaders came in and said, we're going to destroy you. We're going to wipe you off the face of the earth. We're going to eliminate your language. We're going to eliminate the name of your country. And we are going to turn you into us. I don't have any images of Poles being crucified because they were not. But this is Moraviev, a Russian leader who was known as the hangman, who, ha who hanged many, many Poles. In the same way that Jews were driven into diaspora, Poles were driven into diaspora. And this is an image of Poles being sent to Siberia. And Siberia is a very cold, snowy place far to the east. And tens of thousands of Poles were driven to Siberia under the Russians over the course of over 100 years. This very bleak image captures the feeling of being driven into exile in Siberia. And there are many memoirs, some of them published, some of them not published. I've read some of them. And this picture really captures what it felt like to be driven into exile in Siberia. You're a very small human figure in a vast landscape that basically wants to kill you. And here we see a pole being beaten to death. And here we see a metaphorical crucifixion of Poland by the occupying powers. And previously, we saw a map of Jewish diaspora. This map represents Polish diaspora. And the stronger the red color is, the more Poles there are living in that country. And you'll notice that there are many pink countries in Africa. And the Poles that ended up in Africa actually ended up there through Siberia. Stalin drove many Poles into exile in Siberia and then said, OK, I changed my mind. And many of them had to walk across Asia and ended up in the Middle East and in Africa. At this time, there is a strong trend of depicting Poles and Jews as united against oppression. The man playing the musical instrument is Jankiel. He is a very famous figure in Polish literature. He's obviously Jewish, and he's teaching these Polish patriots how to sing the Polish national anthem. In the upper corner, you see in the black and white image an obviously Jewish-looking man warning some Polish patriots that the colonizers are coming. You'd better hide yourself. The picture in the lower corner represents an historical incident. There were some Polish patriots marching. One of them was carrying a cross. He was shot dead. And Michal Landi, a Jewish student, picked up the cross and started marching with it. And he also was shot dead. So there are many images of good Polish-Jewish relations while the Poles are being oppressed by these foreign powers. And that idea, we're all united, we're all fighting for the same thing, we're all fighting for human freedom, is expressed in the Polish saying, for your freedom and ours. But Poland is controlled by other countries who want to destroy Poland. Divide and conquer is a reliable rule for conquerors. The Austrians, the Prussians, and the Russians wanted to divide Poles one from the other. And this is an incident where Austrians offered Polish peasants money for the heads of Polish aristocracy. And the Polish peasants complied and chopped off the heads of Polish aristocracy and sold those heads to the Austrians. And so many heads were brought in that the Austrians stopped paying money and started paying in salt. So divide and conquer was a force that drove peasants away from the aristocrats and drove Catholics away from Jews. 
We jump forward to the 20th century. In September 1939, Poland was attacked by both Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany. Both of these countries wanted to destroy Poland and kill as many Poles as possible, and they did. The Nazis wanted to kill every Jew in Europe. Most of their concentration camps and death camps are placed in Poland. Auschwitz, Birkenau, Majdanek, Chelmno, Treblinka, Sobibor, Bełżec, these are all in Poland. So the Holocaust largely happened in Poland. After the war, many Jews are in Israel. They create a new country. There is new hope for the future, and yet, Poles and Jews are still fighting. Why are Poles and Jews still fighting? I'm going to introduce some of the factors, and there's no way I can introduce all of the nuances involved. After the war in Poland, there were pogroms, riots in which Jews were murdered. A notorious pogrom took place in Kielce in 1946. The war ended in 1945. Jews in Kielce were concentration camp survivors, and many of them, over 40, were killed, including being stoned to death. Also, there was a group of people during the war called Schmalzownice, which is a reference to lard, which is why I have the picture of lard. The Schmalzownice sold information to the Nazis on hiding Jews. So Jews are very upset about bad things that Polish people did during the war. And that's one cause of hostility and controversy. Poles, for their part, are also angry and upset. And Poles are upset that their history is not taught outside of Poland. And I personally argue, not just in this talk, but also in my work and on my blog, that Poles themselves need to tell this story. And we have not done so just one event. These bodies are part of the Katyn massacre. There were also mass expulsions. There were also different Jewish and Polish responses to the Soviet invasion. The cost of Blitzkrieg in Poland, which doesn't compare to any other country attacked by the Nazis. The Poles who were reduced to slave labor by the Nazis. How the Poles were betrayed by America and England, etc. And this is just a listing, which I won't uh, subject you to, of the horrible things that happened to Poland, the numbers of Poles who were enslaved by the Nazis, the number of villages that were raised, destroyed, everyone killed by the Nazis, the number of Poles who were driven into exile by the Soviets, the amount of resistance that the Poles gave to both the Nazis and the Soviets, Poles feel that this history is not known outside of Poland, and it's not. I'll just mention one family. This is the Ulma family. I was privileged to visit their home. Uh, six children, one a seventh child in the womb, Josef and Victoria Ulma. They were very devout Polish Catholic peasants. They really believed that you had to love your neighbor. They took in Jews in an attempt to help them, and the Nazis killed the entire family. And that's just one family of many who were killed by the Nazis for helping Jews. And these images are of people who did amazing things to resist the Nazis. Uh, Witold Pilecki, the man in uniform in the upper corner, volunteered to be sent to Auschwitz. He was a prisoner in Auschwitz in order to gather information for the resistance. He endured being a prisoner in Auschwitz in order to resist the Nazis. Then, after the war, he was arrested by the Soviets and he was killed and buried in an unmarked grave. And the other people on the screen are equally heroic and their story is just not told. And very few people know what happened to Warsaw and how the Nazis do, did everything they could to raise Warsaw to the ground, even as they were fighting a two-front war and losing a two-front war the Nazis were going house to house in Warsaw, destroying museums, churches, private homes, etc., for no other reason except cultural genocide. Today, there's a group that goes to Poland called March of the Living. They are young Jews 
who often have a rather contemptuous view of Poland, and they, they're known for doing some contemptuous things, uh, treating people rudely. And I'll just mention one, one group uh, defecated in their hotel room as, as a gesture of contempt for Poles and Poland. Uh, another cause of contention between Poles and Jews are movies that just completely misrepresent World War II history in Poland, and these are two such films, which I think are excellent films. They're just not telling the truth. We also fight a lot about Holocaust education. I understand this fighting as an expression of an anthropological idea expressed by George Foster, an American anthropologist, limited good. There's only so much good in the world. If I take one of these pieces of pie, there's no pie for anybody else. And what are some of the pieces of pie that, that, that uh, people fight about? Here's, here's one example. This woman, Bojena Urbanovich Gilbride, uh, she herself was a Nazi slave laborer. Her mother was in two concentration camps. She refers to herself as a Polish Catholic Holocaust survivor. The Polish American, Jewish American Council broke relations with her and forbade her from using the word Holocaust. They said, we don't care that you were a slave laborer. We don't care that your mother was in a concentration camp. You cannot use the word Holocaust because you are Catholic and the word Holocaust only belongs to Jews. Uh, here's another example of limited good at work. Uh, in the upper corner, the blue image is the new Polish Museum of Polish Jews, which has just been opened to great fanfare. In the lower black and white image, you see a proposed memorial to Poles who helped Jews during the Holocaust. It just lists the names of some Poles who helped Jews during the Holocaust. This memorial doesn't exist yet. Many people want this memorial never to be built because they feel that highlighting the names of Polish rescuers takes attention away from the Museum of Polish Jews and rewrites history. So I try to express the idea of limited good in these images. There's only so many pages in a book. If you're going to tell the whole Polish story, then are you going to have room for the Jewish story? There's only so much money to go around. There's only so much time. There's only so many movies that you want to go see. I mean, every time a new Holocaust movie opens, I'm like, should I see it? I have to see it. Do I want to see it? The movie in the lower corner depicts some Jews who were rescued by a Polish sewer worker. He hid the Jews in the sewer. And if you show that movie, are you rewriting history because there were also bad Polish people? So there are debates about that. There's only so much compassion. People get tired. People get compassion fatigue. There are other atrocities that we need to talk about. We need to talk about American slavery. And, and there's only so much complexity that people want to put up with. When I tell people that I write about Polish-Jewish relations and they ask me, what is that about? And I try to give them some summary, they just walk away from me. They don't want to hear this big, complicated story that goes back 4,000 years. And that's it. I leave you with the concept of limited good. <laughs>